This is episode 42 of the Life in Norway show. Today I'm joined by Brian Talgo and Brunjolf Haugen, two budding writers living in Norway. Brian is an expat New Yorker and Brunjolf grew up in Canada, but both have lived in Norway for much of their lives. We talk about the Norwegian publishing industry, including some of the most popular authors and genres. We also look at what inspired them to write a series set in the world of the Vikings. Finally, we look at the challenges budding authors face in getting published in Norway. You can find out more information on today's show on the show notes page. Just head on over to lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and look for episode 42. Happy listening. Today I'm joined by Brian Talgo and Brunjolf Haugen, together known as the Lost Viking Writers. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot, David. Good to be here. Today uh, we're going to talk about writing and reading books here in Norway. But before we start, uh, you've both lived in Norway for most of your life, but you had childhoods elsewhere. So can you both uh, briefly introduce yourself, just tell us a little bit about what brought you to Norway, and we'll kick things off with you, Brian. Okay, thanks. Um, I grew up in the States. Um, like many Americans, I lived in different places, but um, mainly I, I grew up in New York. And my family background was Norwegian. My grandfather was Norwegian. So I grew up in a family of four boys, and they were always talking about um, that we were Vikings. So I was implanted in my head uh, as a youth that I was a Viking and Norway was our family home. And the, the thing that brought me to Norway was actually quite funny is I, I met a street musician one day and um, started chatting with him and he started talking about Norway and I said, oh, I'd always wanted to go there. And he said, do you want to go? He said, I'll give you an address. You can write them a letter and you can go to Norway. This was like 1981. And um, I took the address and I wrote to this place called Viderås and Landsby, which is a special place down in um, Vestfold. I said, I'd like to come work for you. And two weeks later, they said, OK. And uh, I was on my way. And I've been here ever since. And Brunjolf, do you have a tale as interesting as Brian's? Not that interesting, because I didn't have a say in the matter of why I had to come to Norway, because I was, I was younger. I was, I was living in a small town called Nelson in British Columbia up in the mountains. And my father, he was, he's Norwegian. That's where I got my name from, of course. And my mum was English. And uh, I guess he just missed the old country and wanted to go back to Norway. And being 10 and a half, I didn't have much say in the matter. So I just had to tag along. So I've been living here since. Okay. Uh, what got you guys into writing? Uh, I know you're both interested in history. You're both interested in Norse culture, the, the Viking sagas and so on. Was it that that got you into writing or was it a love of literature from childhood or, or something else? For me, I guess it was, again, my father. He used to read, uh, read uh, he, didn't, he would always fall asleep when he read us bedtime stories, when he, wrote, when he read uh, children's books. But then we, um, this was the 70s, so there wasn't much else of uh, TV and stuff we could see. So our only media to stories was him, right, because we could read ourselves. So we got him to start reading history books because then he would read for hours because he would read books that he wanted to read. And I think this planted a seed in me, right, and stories, especially from his country, Norway, the Vikings, and uh, it intrigued me. And uh, I think that's where it all started. For, for my part, at least. Um, I've, I've been writing since childhood. Um, I had I have lots of journals and stuff from when I was a kid, and of course the earlier stuff was pretty awful. But I really started getting to writing um, um, about uh, 15 years ago when I found a journal that uh, from my youth, which I thought was quite amusing, and I decided to turn it into a short story. And then it sort of grew into a novel, and then I published it. and. Um, then I just loved writing after that. I, after I got a hold of it and I could control it and, and use it as an art form, um, I just kept writing and writing. And then when uh, <clears throat> Brunjof came to me with his idea and uh, asked me if I wanted to join him as a writer, I said, sure. Although not right away. <laughs> Had to think about it a couple of minutes, but um, 
for us to come together that uh, that was a project I was very interested in. Now, how did that work? Uh, had you both written books before or were you starting off the writing journey as a duo? Well, I, I'd written before. Uh, like I said, I'd written this book called The Beauregard Affair, which is a sort of a novel of my youth around my 20s. I and mean, I've been writing the whole time. I've got several manuscripts lying around. Brunjof? I hadn't done much writing before before this. I'd done a little bit for TV, actually, uh, for a series, and that's about it. I I actually didn't like writing when I was young, I, but um, that's changed. Let's talk a bit about uh, the place that books uh, and literature have here in Norway. Uh, you've both lived in, in other countries and, and travelled a lot, I guess, if you have family overseas and so on. So do you, do you think there's a, a drastic difference between how – people read here in Norway and, and, and how the publishing industry works than, uh, than in other countries? I, I definitely think so. Um, <clears throat> I come from America, and Americans are not big readers uh, as a whole. But my impression is that the Nor Norwegians are voracious readers, both news newspapers and, um, and books. Uh, and... Um, I don't think I've ever almost even met anybody who wasn't a reader of some kind. The thing that's interesting about the Norwegian publishing industry is that they don't have agents, whereas almost all the other countries I know of in the case, especially the English-speaking countries, you can't directly approach a publisher with a manuscript. And even Sweden, we go through, a, through our agent there, whereas in Norway, you just you submit directly to the publisher, which is quite interesting. Any thoughts, Brynjolf? Well, um, I was so young when I lived in Canada, so I couldn't compare the two countries. But uh, I, f I find that Norwegians do read a lot, but especially the last maybe 10 years, less and less because of uh, social media and telephones yeah. and videos. I mean, series. There's a lot more reading before, I, f I, I think. It's too easy to pick up your telephone and look at a series at night than pick up a book and turn on the light. That's very true, and maybe we'll see the impact of this in uh, in 10 or 20 years, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, because I'm afraid that the, the younger people read less and less. Yeah. Uh, that I'm afraid of. It's more, they're more into visual stuff and movies and videos and stuff. Well, right now in, in 2020, uh, my perception is that the, the publishing industry in Norway is is relatively healthy. I, I don't think the publishing industry is strong anywhere in the world, really, but but relatively healthy here in Norway. And the reason I say that is when I travel, and I've written books myself, one of which is a guidebook to Norway. Uh, so I had to travel literally uh, north to south in, in, in the country. Uh, took me to a lot of very small places. And, you know, there's a bookstore in most of these small towns. And it's not the biggest bookstore, but there's there's one there. You can go to a lot of small towns in Britain where there are no bookstores whatsoever anymore. It also seems to me that the threat from self-publishing to the traditional publishing industry doesn't appear to be as strong here in Norway as well. Yeah, it's it's very difficult to go and buy a Kindle, for example, somewhere. There's no local Amazon store and, and, and so on. Um, do you guys think that uh, self-publishing is going to catch on here or for whatever reason, that, that traditional publishing is, is going to remain uh, as it is today? I think, it's, I think it's going to catch on, but it's going to take more time in Norway because you have the, you have the, what's, uh, the Konkurranse Tilsine in English, a, um, competition directory, I think I could translate it with. They, they have a lot of power and they're, they're regulating the prices. And you have big publishing companies that also own the major bookstores, so they re they they can regulate the prices and keep the the um, digital market sort of under control more, which is in one, one way a good thing because that means bookstores will still be able to run because they mm -hmm. still read uh, physical books because you well, have that's, to. Anyway. That's something I've seen. Uh, ebooks, you know, the average price for an ebook on Amazon it's somewhere between three and six dollars or something whereas in norway uh, the ebooks are more like 100 120 krona which is about 10 or 12 dollars and uh, yeah. the, it's a completely different market 
Well, I think another aspect is the fact, like I was saying earlier, that in all these other countries, you have to go through an agent, which is a filtering system. And trying to get an agent is really difficult these days. We, we've tried with, uh, with with the American market and, uh, and the English market, and they are, they are flooded. But I think in Norway, like I said, anybody can actually submit a, a manuscript to a publisher. So there's uh, that filter's not there. I think the, the pressure to do... The, um, self-publishing is a little bit less because you have direct access to uh, to the publishers. That doesn't mean you're going to get published, but uh, I think there's less pressure to to pub- self-publish. That's a really interesting insight. I hadn't considered that. Uh, something else I noticed on my travels through these uh, bookstores in in small towns up and down Norway, you walk into the bookstore and uh, instantly you're hit with shelf after shelf of krim. Um, it's it's the number one genre in Norway by an absolute mile, uh, and you you know you tend to walk into the store and you have crime books and then other books and <laughs> not really anything any other sections. It's crime and other, and you know you walk into a bookstore in any other country, it's structured very, very differently. It, people listening to the show who don't live in Norway, they may or may not know the the popularity of crime fiction here in Norway, and not just in Norway and in Scandinavia as well, but they might not really understand why it is so popular um i have a few ideas but do you guys have any thoughts as to to what uh, the scandinavian obsession is with crime i really i really don't have any idea why it is maybe maybe because i don't like crime myself that much but uh um i don't i don't have a clue why norwegians are so or scandinavians uh, love the, their crime so much but maybe it has something to do with the um, the Norwegian mentality of uh, going up to their cabins at Easter and and there's a lot of uh, media around it that you have to read crime. So it's just become this sort of thing uh, that sort of Easter is reading crime books and people get from an early age get get into it. I, mean, I don't know, but I'm, that might be an idea. Perhaps it's the same reason that everyone buys small oranges at Easter. It's it's not because they want to. It's because you walk into the supermarket and that's all there is to buy. They're absolutely everywhere. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, Brian, any any thoughts from yourself? No, but I also noticed it's not just books. You know, it's also TV. They love the 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 TV series. Also, like the the British crime series are really popular. Mm-hmm. And like when you were saying at Easter, they have what is it, uh, Polska Krim. Mm-hmm. So um, there's something that's fascinating to to them about the the crime stuff. But I, I really couldn't say what it is. I'm not really a big fan of it either. So um, I don't know. I think the the general consensus seems to be, from what I've read, is that we have a, a relatively peaceful society here with you know relatively low crime rates across Scandinavia, especially in Norway. And I guess to a Norwegian, a, a crime novel is more like a fantasy novel, whereas if you're reading a uh, Yul Nesba book in Los Angeles or New York or Toronto, then maybe it's not quite so much like a fantasy book. It's... Uh, yeah, you could maybe you could see uh, these things happening a little more, whereas uh, you know, living in a small town in Norway. I mean, I mean, how many people has um, I've forgotten the guy's name that uh, that made the Wisting books uh, that's just been made into a TV series. Um, but you know, how many people have died in that tiny little town on uh, on the south coast of Norway in his books compared to in real life? Uh, yeah. There's maybe been one or two murders in all this time in in that town, and and in in the books there's been you know ten or fifteen or whatever. I think I think that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of it like that, but uh, I th- I think you might be right that, that um, the murder and crime like that is far removed from the Norwegian culture, and it's it's not dangerous to them in a way because it's not happening. Whereas if you're living in Los Angeles. Maybe it isn't so fascinating because you can read about it in the newspaper. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I also find that crime books here, they're, they're just as much, a, I guess, a social critique as they are a, a, a crime or a mystery book. But I, I, one thing I think is fascinating is the, um, the, that Swedish author with the trilogy, it was said Stieg Larsson, his name is. Mm. Yeah, Stieg Larsson. Those were really quite violent and a little bit gruesome in a way, but they were super popular. But the, they're sort of more than crime. They have a little bit of everything in it, right? A little bit of mystery. You have a little bit of sort of love. You have a. It's not just true, just pure crime, and it's always it always has this twist, right? 
Yeah, that's true. Char- characters are very well developed, right? They're special. That's true. And so many of these books have been turned into TV series and movies as well, of course. And um, it's uh, perhaps it's a way into to the literature for a lot of people uh, uh, at a young age here in Norway. I'm, I'm not so sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that could be. Beyond crime, um, let's talk about English books because you guys are writing in English, right? Or are you writing in Norwegian? Write in English. Yeah. You're writing in English. So what's what's the place that English language books have in the world of reading here in Norway? I think it's, uh, well, the Norwegians, they, they speak and read English quite well. And I, when I go into bookstores, I usually look for English books. And I, I think that there's quite a big choice, actually, in the, the big bookstores, at least. But I think it's, um, I think more and more people, in, in Norwegian people, do read English books than before, at least. You wouldn't see them back in the 80s and 90s as much. No, and, and a lot of them want to read the original version. They want to read in English. Yeah. There, there, I think the, the younger people are even more... Um, up on it because especially things like science fiction and that kind of uh, literature they definitely want to read the originals mm. but i know i know that I, I tried to get my book published uh, many years ago um in norway and i went and talked to some of the publishers and i know there's been a discussion of whether they should accept uh, english manuscripts and publish them in norway because there is a large um group of english writers who live in norway you know, there are a lot of brits there are a lot of americans and other people who, who write in english and it's, it's really quite difficult um to get an agent if you're living in norway and you try to get an agent in the uk or um in america the first thing the agent kind of looks at your address and thinks hmm, i don't know they pass you over maybe because it's just too difficult but i know it has been discussed but as of today i don't think any publishers are accepting english manuscripts Do you guys read in English or do you prefer to read in Norwegian? Well, I prefer to read in English, but uh, it depends if if I can get, if it's a Norwegian book that's written in Norwegian, I'll read it in Norwegian though, right? Mm. So I I like to read it in in the language it was written in. Definitely. Yeah, Yeah, you've you've both sort of hinted that you're not really big crime readers. So who are your favorite authors here in Norway? Well, mine, I would say, would be uh, Bjorn Andreas Bullhansen. He's a Viking writer. I like Viking books. So he's uh, he's written uh, some good series about the Jums Viking and uh, another series that was about the, the god Tyr. I think his writing is pretty fascinating. I like him. But also um, Tom Eglon, um, Lars Solby Christiansen, The Beatles. I like that book, I remember. Uh, Jan Ove Ekeberg, also a Viking writer. When you say a Viking writer, what are we talking about here? Are they are they like uh, fiction stories based on sagas, or are they entirely made up? Or what what's what's the Viking genre when it comes to fiction? Well, you have both. You have ma- made up stories, but you have most of them. I think they sort of they base their stories on some of the sagas, right? And then they sort of fill in the the bits and pieces that they don't know, right? Um, but you have also writers that is completely fiction. Mm. But then you also have the more fantasy Viking writers, which is uh, very fiction and, and and of course didn't happen. But from for my I, like, I always like to read a story that's based in history. I like for for my sake I like that the, the best. And Brian, how about yourself? Well, I have a I have a funny anecdote um, about one of my favorite writers, and that's Knut Thompson. Um, and that's also one of the reasons I came here, um, because I was uh, visiting a friend of mine up in Lake Winnipesaukee in the U.S. one time, and um, I fell asleep on the floor of his, he had a little library, his grandfather had a library, and I was scanning the shelves, looking at the books, wondering what I was going to pluck out. Suddenly I saw a book called uh, Segelfoss Bai, which made absolutely no sense to me, that it was not a word, that it wasn't anything. So I went and I pulled it out, and Seglefoss by was actually Seglefoss B by Knut Thompson, who I'd never heard of. And I started leafing through it, and I suddenly it was in English, and I suddenly realized um, that uh, that this was a Norwegian writer, classical Norwegian writer. And I asked my friend about it, and he said, "Yeah, he's very famous." So I read it. And I was completely consumed by his style and his descriptions of Norway. 
And so I swiped it from him, and I still have it this day. But the reason I allowed myself to swipe it from him was because he swiped it from the local library. <laughs> it's, got a, it's got a stamp on the inside. But in any case, after I read that one, I read all the translated Thompson I could get, and I just I fell in love with his literature. That's before I knew his uh, checkered background, which I'm glad I didn't know at the time because I might not have liked him then. But um, I liked him a lot, and I like some of the other classic uh, Norwegian writers, like Jens Björn Nebu. Um, I think he's a fantastic writer. I love his stuff. And for humor, you can't beat Erlen Lu. Yeah, of course, Erlen Lu. He, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's fantastic. Yeah. Now, we've been talking, guys, for just over 20 minutes. I think uh, it's about time we had a chat about the books you've written together. So, um, yeah, give us an intro. What kind of books have you written? Uh, tell us the, the names of them. and What are they about? Well, the first book is called the um, was it trilogy. And the first book is called uh, The Salt of Ancient Tears. It has different genres it has um it's it's a historical it's uh mystical i guess it's uh it's a love it's definitely a love story but it also has um uh elements of being a thriller which uh when we first started writing it we thought was a good idea to have a lot of mix but uh publishing getting it published is not that easy when it doesn't have a, a sort of straightforward um genre but the book is about uh, it's based on um the uh, the greenland vikings uh, who lived in in uh, who lived in the greenland around f- well from year 1000 with life ericsson and um until about 14 almost 1500 and they disappeared and no one really knows what happened to them what happened to these about 500 people that lived there they uh, there's no record of what happened to them they didn't they know they didn't come back to norway or iceland so they disappeared and that was one of the stories my dad used to tell me as a bedtime story when i was a kid and it always fascinated me what happened to all these vikings it's 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 a it's an incredible mystery right and there's there's lots of theories of what happened to them and uh, and i always thought it would be a good idea to use this mystery in a book some way but the book is also not just a historical viking book it's uh, it's uh, it's also plays out in oslo today to in the late 2000 or around our time okay so it's a it's a story that um plays back and forth from the 14th century to to now and is basically a love story between two people that lived then and uh, today it sounds quite an ambitious project for your first co-written uh, story and y- you've also said previously that you uh, you prefer stories that have some historical grounding not necessarily 100% fact but but you know pe- the the author is is basing uh, the fiction around historical markers so did you have to do a lot of research for this in in addition to having that initial idea yeah, we, I think we know more about the Greenland Vikings than almost anybody else on the planet Earth now. Right. <laughs> Thanks to internet, and and I I worked at the I work at the University of Oslo, so I had uh, the whole library at my fingertips. So and like like when you've said, he got all this history from his father. So um, he was he was primed and ready to go. But the funny thing was, I I didn't I had read a lot about Vikings and the Norse people, but I didn't. I didn't know about the Greenland Norse. So when Greenio pitched his story to me, that's what got me to bite when he said there were these 5,000 people disappeared without a trace. And I, I got so fascinated by his history story that uh, I wanted in to be on that project. But it is, it is a very um, it's ambitious, and it's called in literature, it's called high concept, and it's extremely high concept. But it's also a lot of fun because... Um, I think that people who have read it really appreciate it because it's quite different. As Brynja have said, it um, it has many different genres in it based on this history that's a real event and a mystery. So um, I like high concept books and um, it really appealed to me the idea of mixing these genres and basing it on something that was so exciting. So, but it can also be difficult to market because um, People like to have a stamp on it. 
I'm really curious to know whether the mystery of what happened to those Vikings gets solved, but I'm not going to ask you to answer that because it's, <laughs> it's not fair on the listeners who uh, who are going to want to read the book. So I think I'll ask you that question after the interview ends. But let me ask you this instead. It's a trilogy, you said. So had you planned on it being a trilogy from the beginning or you wrote book one and then decided to carry on? I think it was pretty early on we figured out that it had to be a, tri- a trilogy because it uh, there's so much... The story sort of evolved along the way, and it was, uh, and we, and we also wanted to get that part of, because the Vikings also went to America, right, to the Vinland, and we, we really wanted to get that meeting of uh, Norsemen meets uh, Native Americans, right, the two culture, two great cultures, right, that that actually coexisted for maybe hundreds of years. And so very early on, we, we figured out that we the story had to continue. I have a few more questions about your books, but I just want to take a bit of a tangent. Um, I'm curious to know your views, if you've seen the series uh, Vikings, the History Channel series, which has been broadcast over in, in Norway and is, is now on HBO and, and Netflix, I think. Have you guys see, seen the series? Yeah. Now, for me, it's... It has a lot of basis in history. There's a lot of uh, characters that were appeared in the sagas. There's a lot of stories such as the sacking of Paris that are known to be true. And of course, Lindisfarne in the very first episode. Um, are you sat there watching that, enjoying it? Or are you sat there watching it thinking, oh, it wouldn't have happened like this? Well, I remember seeing it when it first came out. I really liked it. And then it started getting, it came, I think it was the second season then i sort of fell out because it was getting too i mean it does follow a lot of things that happen but it's sort of like in two generations the whole viking history is told right and that sort of i i gave up but then i started watching it again and I actually just recently just saw the whole thing i, I enjoyed it i mean it, you just have to take it for what it is right yeah, they, they've taken all the exciting parts of the vikings history and put it into one and that it works i think it i was i was entertained that's funny because it was exact uh, same for me that I started watching, and I, I think I might have even stopped at the same point Brynjolf did, when they they <laughs> yeah. had some kind of weird scene where they're up in the forest with these white clothes on, and they were going to sacrifice somebody, and then I said to myself, "This is getting hokey. This isn't really Viking stuff." So I stopped watching. And then uh, a year or two later, my son came to me and he goes, uh, should, should we give it another try? And I said, okay, let's do it again. And we started at that point and then went further, and then I really started enjoying it again. And um, like you say, the sacking of Paris, which they never actually got through, just like in the in the book, I mean, in the true history. Um, <clears throat> so like Brynjolf said, I think you have to take it for what it is. And this beautiful, the costumes and everything are fantastic, and the acting is great. But um, it's, I'm sure it diverges quite a bit from reality, but it's a, it's a great story. Yeah. I mean, the truth, of course, is that nobody really knows what happens. We're, we're relying on... Uh, the, all the written sources were written by people who were defeated generally, and um, the Vikings didn't tend to write things down. So we're we're reliant on oral history, and uh, that, of course, is notoriously unreliable. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this the series. I was just curious. Let's get back to your books, guys. So what is the writing process like? Uh, I've actually co-written nonfiction book with someone, and... That process was actually pretty easy because we both had our expertise. We took a chapter each and then we, we could edit it as a, as a a finished article. But, but when you're writing fiction, you, you can't really take a chapter each like that. Can you, do you write individual characters or how does it work? Well, we, we we don't collaborate in that manner. Um, The thing is that Brynjolf, this is Brynjolf's idea. It's his baby that he cooked up. And um, it came to me because he'd read my first book, and he, I think he liked what I'd written. And he asked me if we should do this together. So I basically write the text, uh, and there's, which is probably a good thing because I think it might be really difficult to write fiction together. That um, if each did a chapter, I think that people would be arguing, or I don't know. I, I don't know if I can see it like that. But. Uh, uh, speaking for Brynjolf now, and he's basically the idea generator, and um, he will come with these ideas, and um, we'll discuss them. And um, sometimes his ideas are quite uh, 
out there and I try to bring them down and maybe I bring them down too much and then he lifts them up again. So it's a, a back and forth process and um, it's really quite fascinating and it's really fun to be together and do it. And we get so much done when we're sitting there face to face doing this, this process. So um, what it might happen is I'll be writing and he'll be two steps ahead of me with the new ideas and it'll go back and forth like that. Wow, oh, that's really interesting. I guess the only way uh, a chapter at a time or a chapter each approach could work is if you had two point of view characters and maybe one of you was writing as the hero and one of you was writing as the villain. Uh, that could get rather uh, interesting maybe. But um, yeah, that's an interesting way to to do it. Uh, Brunjolf, how, how does it work from your perspective? Well, I, I'm just thinking, I know that most writers that co-write, they, they usually take a chapter each or they write a, a character each. But uh, I really like writing together because you have um, you have someone to a dialogue with two people, right? And writing is a very lonely um, profession. But to be two, you always have uh, you have someone to, crit to, to, to criticize what you're thinking, right? You have someone to play to play ball with in a way, and it's, it's it doesn't make it as lonely, right? You, you're, we write a lot together. We go up to cabins and write. We go abroad on trips and. Uh, yeah, yeah, inspired and and do do the writing together instead of just being alone, and um, and how we've sort of uh, come up with uh, how we work together. Also, I find is uh, sort of um, we use each other's strengths to do to get the best book possible. How have the books been received? What sort of a response have you had? <laughs> That's a difficult question because yeah. um, <laughs> because we um, we were first published by a small uh, Norwegian publisher, um, and the book came out in uh, in Norwegian, and um, the people who read it loved it, to put it like that. And um, Brunjolf was very uh, active in marketing it because the publisher really wasn't, and I think it sold in the end maybe seven or eight hundred copies in the months that it was out there. I've got a lot of really good uh, uh, feedback from, them. but um, we weren't entirely satisfied with uh, with the publisher, so we asked to get our rights back, which we did eventually, because at the same time we um, we found an agent in Sweden, uh, the Enberg Agency, who were looking at a on a larger scale. They're thinking of Europe and and um, America. So then we <clears throat> got in with them, and they loved the book. Uh, at that time, it was one book. And so then they started marketing it, and um, it, they were trying to sell it around Europe, and they've sold it to Lithuania, which haven't come out yet. And just recently, it came out in um, in the Czech Republic. So it's only been out in the Czech Republic for about a month, but it's um, it's starting to gather interest. And Brynjolf just, just sent me a, a YouTube today of this young lady who was talking about it and trying to spread the word. So it's a, it's a waiting game. We'll see how that goes. And in the meanwhile, of course, our agent is trying to enter the different markets. But we ha I can tell a funny, uh, another funny anecdote, and that was we were on the verge of getting a, a, a rather known Norwegian publisher. And at the time, we had an English um, literary agent. And the literary agent, um, he contacted the Norwegian publisher who was getting ready to go with us. And then they started arguing because here we're talking about different cultures. And the thing is in Norway, you do not get an advance on your book. Generally, you usually you get royalties after the book is published, but um, the, the English uh, literary agent, he couldn't understand that. And he wanted an advance. And so they actually started arguing while we were on the sidelines. In the end, um, the publisher just dropped the whole idea. So, that's a, that was a missed chance, but um, that's the way it goes sometimes. And are your books available to buy for somebody listening to this in the U.S.? Uh, not yet, which is kind of a weird thing that two foreign countries have bought the translation rights before the original has even come out. That's really hmm. extraordinary if you think about um, they invest a lot of money for the translation and something that really doesn't have a track record. But, um, of course, we were hoping to uh, – to, to get a sale in either the UK or the States. Mm. But I think another thing is that um, 
because it's a trilogy, now we've we've written the first one, which when you were talking about the uh, Salt of Ancient Tears, and now we've got the second one completed, uh, The Way of the Raven, and we're working on the third one now. And I think the, the message we're getting from our agent is people are a little bit wary of buying into it unless they have seen all three books. So again, it's kind of a waiting game, and um, I'm thinking that... Uh, it might be first after that third book is published or uh, written that um, they can really go out there and try to sell it as a trilogy. Mm-hmm. Are you going to consider self-publishing in, in English so that uh, you have potential sales around the world or are you set on finding a publisher? Well, we're bound to our agent. She's got the rights to the books. So as long as we're with the agent, uh, that we, we can't do anything on the side like that. Well, it's watch this space for now then. Uh, Guys, this has been really interesting. Where can people find out more about you and your books? Well, we have a Facebook page. What's that called again, Brian? Lost Viking Writers. Lost Viking Writers, of course. And we had a web page, but we've um, we've decided to um, redo it. So that's under the making. And I guess that's going to be – what's that going to – I can't remember anything, Brian. What's that called? (laughs) Probably Lost Viking Riders. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll include links to uh, whatever you guys decide uh, in the show notes, which will be available at lifeinnorway.net slash podcast. I'm going to close with uh, the stan- standard questions I ask every guest on the Life in Norway show. Of course, there's two of you, so it's, it's going to take a little bit longer. So uh, quick answers, please. We'll start with Brian. Uh, what's the best thing about living in Norway? That's difficult. Because for me, they're two best things, but I have to go with my first best thing, and that's the nature. My education background, I'm a, I'm a botanical uh, ecologist. I have a total love for nature, and uh, the nature in Norway is just uh, astounding. I mean, you've got, uh, you've got the ocean, you've got the forest, you've got the mountains, you have the four seasons. It's just incredible. And I live in Oslo and, and on the outskirts, but still – it's uh, five minutes away from deep forest for me. So I just absolutely love the nature. But with that said, I also have to say the politics of Norway um, are perfect for me. And um, gender politics, the democracy, all of that, it just fits perfectly. And I love it. Couldn't be better. And Bruno, same question to you. Well, uh- I tried living in Canada in 2007 for a year with my family, and I started. And I like Canada. I mean, as Brian says, the nature is incredible in Norway, but it's also really nice in Canada. It's quite similar in some ways. It's just a lot wilder. And I got the feel. I really missed Norway when I was in Canada because um, I just felt so far away from everything. You have the nature there, but it's so it's such a young country. It's um, there's no history. There's no cult. Or there's no, there is history, but you don't. I mean, you don't have the ancient uh, old buildings, right? You you just feel far away from everything, and um, and it got me to thinking why I really like Norway, and, it, and I think it's that you have the culture nearby. You have Europe at your doorstep, the whole Europe, not far away too, right? But you also have nature at the same time. You can actually. The, the distances aren't too far from the sea to the fjords to the mountains, but also to the whole of Europe and its culture. So that, I think that's what got me thinking about that when I was living in Canada, which I also love. But Okay, and while you're on a roll, Brunjolf, uh, you can uh, give me the answer to this. What do you find most challenging about living here in Norway? Wow, oh, that was difficult. I don't, I don't, can't. I don't find it challenging. <laughs> I, I guess, you know, the, these questions are originally for people that have lived here a couple of years. So for you guys, maybe it's a bit more difficult to uh, well, I can, I can to answer, answer from being a kid when I came here. Because I remember um, one thing is that I remember sitting on a, a trick or a tram into Oslo from Kolsa. And there was three people in front of me, two on the sides. And we stared at each other for an hour. No one said a word. And coming from Canada, I just didn't know where to, what to do, where to put my hands, right? Because no one was talking. It was just staring at each other. So I remember that that part. And also, I also remember another episode. I'd sort of, my friends, I'd sort of give them a sort of a, a hug or just a sort of clap on the shoulders. And you just didn't do that in the 80s, at least. You do that now. But I remember getting the reaction 
from my friends that that was a no-no. So I, I think it would have to be um, what I found difficult was that it was it was just a different way of communicating with people. It was just it felt a little bit unfriendly. But as soon as you get to know Norwegians, they're the most friendly people. It just take, it takes the time to get under their skin. And I noticed yeah. that when I went back to Canada too. It's um, you get you get to know people quicker, but maybe and I'm generalizing a bit, but uh, maybe not as deep in a way. Um, Brian, how about you? I have no problem in answering that question, and that is the long, dark winter. Um, I think that's, uh, especially November, when it starts raining in Oslo, and it's dark, and uh, the nights are turning into an eternity, I find that uh, difficult. Or I used to, because we kind of, we kind of fixed it. Uh, my wife and I, we bought a gigantic wood-burning oven with big glass windows. And so we heat our house with uh, with wood, and the fire in the dark evenings is – the only word you can use is Norwegian. That's kufle. And that helps a lot. But um, that that was mostly the, the, the long, dark winters uh, until, like, February that uh, I find a bit heavy. Yeah, Not the so- snow, but the darkness. And that's a very common answer to this question. Uh, last of all, where, what's your favorite spot in Norway, Brian? There are a lot of them, but I think um, one of my very favorite spots is um, Hardangavida. Um, hey, that's what I was going to say. Ah, gotcha. Um, I went there once uh, when I hadn't been living here that long. as back in uh, the early 80s. Um, I went for a trek by myself for several days through Hardangavida. And uh, it just totally blew me away. There's something so special about that place. It's it's so very empty in a way, and yet it's not empty at all. And it's so vast. So I fell in love with it. And then later, when um, I was studying as a uh, studying biology, they had the university has a research station up there. So I got to stay up there and walk around and investigate all the plant life. So that just cemented my love for Hardanger even more. So. Um, I think that's it. Plus, it's a great train ride up there. So, Bruno, if you were going to say Hadangavida also, uh, maybe for different reasons, though. No, but there is another place I just thought of, and that is uh, Sholden in the West Coast and the Song of the Fjord. There's one place where I used to go a lot in the summer, and up on the top of the mountain, you had one point where you could see the Song of the Fjord, um, the, the Song of the Fjord, the Fjord, and uh, you could see the the Jotunheimen from the same point, and you could see the great, the big glacier and you could see the song in the fjord at the same time at that very same spot and the lake and that was that was norway in a nutshell in a way i thought it was beautiful great guys this has been really interesting thanks so much for joining us and uh, i wish you well with the books are you planning on writing any more once the series has finished hard to say yeah sort of one book at a time it's just have to get that finished before uh, what we, we I think we have enough ideas to do it but uh, one book at a time I think yeah. you can find out more about everything we've spoken about on the show today including how to follow Brian and Brunjof online on our show notes page at lifeinnorway.net slash podcast guys thanks so much for joining us today well thank you so much for having us it's been great thank you so much yeah, David it's great being on it Yeah.